Nisha Moodley, and this is Devotion, the podcast about showing up in new ways to weave a new world together. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Devotion Podcast, Episode 4. Today, we're going to talk about something that has been on my mind quite a lot lately as I'm starting this podcast as a new project. And that is, how do we be with the creative gap when we are building something new, creating something new, maybe not even new, um, but recognizing that there is a gap between how we want something to be, uh, the quality with which we want to be creating, um, or the quality with which we want to be showing up, and where things actually are. Um, that creative gap in vision versus output. And I think a lot about, actually, as I say this, I have this memory of being a small child and having these really beautiful images in my head, you know, kind of storybook pictures, and then trying to create them, you know, paint, draw, whatever. And I remember doing that once. Actually, I had gone to see the movie E.T. at the theater, and I decided that I was going to paint a big picture of E.T. and everyone watching E.T. at the movie theater. It was kind of like the big screen from my vantage point, which included all the heads in front of me. And I remember having this picture so clear in my mind, and then I painted it and I remember stepping back. I was in kindergarten and thinking, that doesn't look right at all. (laughs) So that's a very young example of what I'm talking about. But of course, I think it's something that in different ways, most of us can relate to in our adulthood too and the creative projects that we take on. So very often, my dear friend Jada Selner, when I'm bumping up against one of these, uh, you know, belly aches over the gap, or even not only belly aches, but moments where I'm feeling held back by that gap. She will send me a short, it's kind of like a two minute, I think, video by Ira Glass called The Gap, which is exactly about this. And I don't know if you all know who Ira Glass is. I actually happen to have a long time, huge crush on Ira Glass, which um, he doesn't know that I even exist. Um, but I'll tell you a, the story of when I met Ira Glass. If you stick around, I'll, I'll drop that in at the end of the podcast. I don't want to get completely off the rails here. But um, Ira Glass is a podcast luminary and uh, among other things and uh, the host of This American Life, which is one of the most beautifully produced podcasts I think ever. Um, And of course, poetically, he also created this two minute video, well, audio that's been turned into a video um, called The Gap. And it is exactly about that, that when we start out um, with a creative endeavor, we often do it because we have really great taste and we have really great taste because we're interested in that thing that we're engaging with. So in my case, I decided to do a podcast versus doing videos, for example, because I am an avid podcast listener. I love podcasts. And because I love podcasts, I know podcasts. I listen to a lot of them. A lot of the podcasts that I listen to are really 
highly produced. They have a lot of money behind them. They have a lot of highly skilled people um, working on the projects. And my people are are amazing. So this is not about them, but I'm talking about the talent too, you know, the person who's behind the microphone and also just the, the volume of resources. You know, you'll have probably a few different sound engineers working on one project. So, um, so he talks about how that great taste is actually the, the thing that really reveals for us the gap in, um, in quality, in production quality. So I will stop talking about it and let you actually just go ahead and watch it if you want to search it online, Ira Glass, The Gap. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of the basis from which I come to this conversation, um, this recognition that often when we are working on something or about to start working on something, what can really hold us back is this feeling that we will not be able to or are not producing at the level that we would like to be producing. And it can be really disheartening. It can be paralyzing even. And I find a lot of people hold themselves back from creating their art or making art of their work or doing their work in a way that feels creatively fulfilling because they have really good taste. And because of that really good taste are holding themselves back from going really all in on that creative expression. So I wanted to share about what has really worked for me and what often has worked for my clients when they find themselves in this position. So the first thing is really connecting to your bigger why. And to me, my bigger why is my North Star. It's my vision for the future for our world that inspires me and that calls me forth. And I'm included in that vision in some ways. So what the, my vision is for my own life as well. And I don't mean to imply that all of our projects have to, <laughs> that we have to believe in some way that our project is is inherently you know, or directly making the world a better place or saving, quote unquote, saving the world. Um, certainly they, that may be true. And I assume that nobody is listening here thinking like, hmm, what is the project that I can work on that would make the world a worse place? <laughs> um, but I think that it can be dicey when we feel like we have to tether our projects to this has to make the world a better place in a measurable and meaningful way. And maybe it's just a, a passion project. It's something that we deeply want to do. So the reason that I say to connect with this bigger why and this bigger North Star is, you know, one, I think just aligning ourselves with that vision of the future also can bring forth a bit of like, that's what I'm here for ultimately. And if I'm not doing anything that feels like it's really harmful to that vision, why not? Let's go for it. And, you know, also in this question of what is the future that we want to live in, it's not just how the world or our lives look or feel, but what are the values that we want to be kind of underpinning um, or weaving together this world that we are kind of co-creating together. And so for myself, you know, some of the things that I want to be true in this world are that we don't have to be perfect to have a voice and we don't have to be dominant in order to have a voice and that we have the freedom to take creative risks and try things and do things that are pleasurable for the sake of exploration when they're not harming other people. So this question of what is the bigger why, what is my bigger vision for my life and for the world, it may there may be a very direct connection between that and whatever project we're working on. But I think it might also just bring forth a feeling of like, why the heck not? You know, th this is this is our chance to go for it in this lifetime. And if we're not moving away from that vision, then why not give it a shot and go for this thing that we feel called to create? 
I think it's also helpful to be really honest about what the other intentions are that we have inside of or behind our projects or our creations. It's likely true that for most of us, there are intentions like wanting to get attention or wanting to look good or wanting to make money or um, whatever it might be. And I'm not saying that those are uh, inherently there, but I think that it's worth us looking to see what else, what else is there. I think that often we have this like, I have good intentions and we want to hold on to this notion that we have good intentions. And first of all, we could have a whole other conversation about the good, bad binary um, and the, the falsehood of it and the limitations of it. But what I really want to talk about, because that's a much bigger conversation, is just recognizing that often there are a lot of intentions, sometimes conflicting intentions that can be fueling our projects. And I think it's really helpful for us to be honest with ourselves about what those are so that as we're creating, we're clear if we actually want to be creating with those intentions. And if we don't, well, there's a good opportunity to check ourselves. And if we do want to be creating with those intentions, or it just is a fact that we are, and it seems unshakable, then recognize that some of those intentions might uh, not be fulfilled for a while. So if the intention is to look good and you are making your art and fumbling your way through and doing your best, um, you know, you might not feel like you look good for a while. And I guess we each get to decide whether or not that's meaningful or matters to us. But I think the bottom line with this is being honest with ourselves about what all the different layers of intention that we can uncover because there are surely ones that we will not even be able to see or know. But what are the ones that we are able to see and know? And ideally, we have the opportunity then to let the bigger thing be the bigger thing. You know, when I say that, what I mean is I have a bigger intention with this podcast, which is just to create a space of conversation and exploration around topics that I find really interesting and that a lot of people I know found, find really interesting. And to have this as a creative outlet for myself is also one. And if I have some other intentions, which for me would be much smaller intentions, letting them be smaller and letting it be okay if those intentions are not fulfilled but the bigger intentions for this to be a creative outlet, for it to be a space to have, you know, meaningful and thoughtful conversations um, that those get fulfilled. So I guess we've talked a little bit about intention and that bigger why and also some of the maybe smaller intentions that are woven in as well. But I think it's also really important to honor where we are in the learning. And I say this because, yes, I want to live in a world where we don't have to be perfect to have a voice and we get to take creative risks and try things and um, and so forth. But I also want to live in a world of integrity. And an example, actually, of where some of this restraint came into play for me is I did a family constellation training a couple of years ago. I had done one, but a very brief one in my coaching training several years ago, 10 years or so ago in one of my coaching trainings. But then I did another one, um, gosh, a year or two ago. Can't remember exactly, but sometime in the last two years. And I came out of that training feeling really strong in a couple aspects of the training and feeling like I had more learning to do. I mean, we will always have more learning to do, and I recognize that it's not something I'm going to master um, just by learning it. The mastery, I think, comes from much more depth of experience. And so paradoxically, you know, we get that experience by doing, but also for me, I recognized that there was a limitation for me in that 
I felt really, really comfortable doing some of the constellations and not fully ready to hold some of the other types of constellations unless I was partnering with someone in them. So, you know, co-facilitating basically. And I think that's really important for us to do integrity checks around what we're creating. And, you know, that's not a really popular point of view, I think, in some circles where we're like, throw caution to the wind and just try it. And how will you ever know if if you don't dive in head first? And I think well, through one lens, that could be true. And through another lens, you know, we also have to walk a path that feels deeply true to us. And so I think it's really helpful to ferret out where we're coming out, where we're coming from, um, where that withhold or holding back is perfectionism. So I have to be perfect or I'm not worthy or I have to be as good as my teacher or I can't begin. And where it's coming from a deeper sense, a deeper, more rooted sense of integrity and alignment or a deeper knowing. And, you know, obviously I can't tell anybody, um, especially if I don't know them, I can't reflect to somebody what their truth is around that. But I think it's helpful for each of us to know that for ourselves. And if we're not clear on that for ourselves to also find somebody in our lives who can really reflect us back to ourselves clearly and help us see where if there is um, hesitation on our creative path to putting our work out there or diving into the work, where is that, um, yeah, that sort of hyper-perfectionism and where is it, you know, a deeper truth of our integrity. Next thing is I think it's so important to have creative cheerleaders. I really do. I feel very blessed to have some really beautiful creative cheerleaders in my life. And I think it's especially helpful to have create creative cheerleaders who are working on projects that are in some way similar to ours. So if I was writing a book, having some creative cheerleaders who had also written books or were in the process of writing books as well. And even though we might do that very differently, you know, we may have very different paths with it. I think it's so profoundly helpful to have people who are either going through the process or have been through the process to encourage us and egg us on and understand or at least move with us through some of the growing pains of the project. And, you know, for myself with bringing this podcast out, for example, it's been so incredibly helpful to be able to, you know, reach out to friends who have podcasts and say, what microphone did you use? And, or do you have a list of resources that you find that you found really helpful in putting this together? Or, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm really struggling with this creative gap of feeling like, is it going to be any good? And did you feel that? What did you do about that? Um, And I feel like we have so much wisdom to share with one another. And we often just hold back because we don't want to annoy people or because we're kind of bought into this mm, competitive, each person for themselves narrative, which I find just overall so entirely toxic. Um, But I'm such a fan of masterminds, of resource sharing, community resource sharing. And I highly recommend if you are working on a creative project, um, bringing something out into the world, find other people who are bringing it out into the world too or who are passionate about supporting people who are bringing that out into the world. Um, You know, join a a writer's group held by an author who you really respect. For example, if you are writing a book or form a peer mastermind of folks who are working on a similar kind of project. Um, And I, I just cannot overstate the power and value of having that kind of support. Another thing that I find really helpful when we're working on creative projects, um, you know, creative, creative 
um, expressions is really getting clear on what the fears are, especially if we're being feeling really held back with the project. What are the actual fears? And I personally am not a fan of the smash fear, crush fear, you know, annihilate fear narrative. I think that our fears um, are just information. And I'm not saying that I want to take my voice of fear and put it at the wheel all the time. Um, You know, it's one thing to put my intuition at the wheel. I wouldn't necessarily want to put my fear at the wheel, but I'm also not trying to, you know, kick it out of the car. I'm much more interested in actually interviewing my fear and getting curious. Like, okay, well, what are you afraid is going to happen? And what are you afraid is going to happen if that happens? And I find it really valuable, especially if we're frozen, you know, especially if we're finding that we're delaying a project, um, if we're putting things off, or if we kind of keep stopping and starting with it. I find it really helpful to get inside those fears and create a plan and create a backup plan. Um, this, I think, really kind of flies in the face of a lot of the narratives out there that say, you know, don't have a backup plan. You have your one plan, which is your plan for a perfectly positive outcome. And that's it. You go for that, period. There's no plan B. And I think that for myself, anyways, I will speak for myself. When I have done that, it has had me attached to things, whether they're projects or relationships, that at some point were not mine anymore. And also have had me feel really bad about not feeling really good about a project or about a relationship or whatever it might be. We need, in most cases, I believe, to have the freedom to be able to change our minds. Maybe in all cases, but Hmm, maybe not. We'll just say in most cases, we need to have the freedom to be able to change our minds. And so, for example, when I really got into all the fears around this podcast, I just got clear on what my plan was. My plan was I'm going to do 20 episodes. They're going to be open format. So I'll do some solo episodes. I will try some interviews. Maybe I'll do some other ones where I take questions or work with people, um, work with people live. We'll see, but I'm going to do 20 episodes, open format and see how it feels. And my backup plan, if I don't like it is I get to quit. (laughs) That's fine. So this piece about listening to the fears, interviewing the fears, not so that we can necessarily completely succumb to them, but just so that we can say, okay, let me just put it all all out on the table and see what's here and get inside whatever it is that's holding me back and figure out, okay, well, what what do I, what can I really honestly commit to? And then what's my choice if that isn't working out? What will I do? Every, not everybody will need this, but if that's helpful for you, especially if you've found yourself kind of stuck with moving forward, I think that piece can be really, really helpful. And I think another piece that can be really, really helpful is just developing shame resilience. And for me, part of what this means is just holding the parts of me that are fearful and holding myself really in a field of unconditional love. You know, when I was working on Global Sisterhood Day for the first time, which was one of the biggest, probably the, well, it was one of the biggest projects I'd ever worked on. And there were many different people working on the project from all over the world, trying to do things in concert. It was running way behind. We were having major tech issues. It was It was really intense. And I was in Costa Rica at the time and I was working at a cafe and we were, you know, (laughs) I would say the 11th hour, but it was like 
the the 18th hour, like we had missed our deadlines and pushed, created a new deadline and then missed that one and created a new one. And I was so determined to make this, this final deadline because it really felt like this is our last chance to really pull this off and have it be successful. And I was on, I think, Skype chat. It was Skype chat with a group of people. We were all working on the project at the same time. And I was amped. Like my heart rate was elevated. I was going kind of a mile a minute. Um, My energy, it was like, I was like an over-caffeinated squirrel. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I just completely, you know, freaked out and trying to manage a million things in my head. And just in that moment, the power went out. And it took me a minute to realize that that had happened actually because uh, the the chat wasn't loading or sending or something. And then, and the, you know, I was in this cafe in Costa Rica and the Wi-Fi was kind of shaky as it was. And I realized that the fans in the restaurant had slowed down and everything had gotten quiet. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the cafe next door. And uh, I, I don't remember how, but I found out that, that the power was not just out in that one cafe. The power was out kind of along the strip that I was on. There was literally nothing I could do. Thank goodness in retrospect, because I took my kind of manic energy and said, I need to, okay, I just need to close this computer because I literally can't do anything with it right now. And I need to go for a walk on the beach. And I got to the beach, I was by myself. And I was just beside myself, you know, I, I, w- I wasn't crying or not that that would be a problem. But when I say beside myself, what I mean is that I was just um, so wound up. I was completely wound up. And I thought to myself, okay, what is it that I need right now? What is it that I need? And I remember feeling like I was reaching for a voice of encouragement inside of me. And I could find this voice that I relate to as my inner mother. And that voice could say things like, I love you, you know, rest your head back, all is well. There's nothing you have to do or say or prove to earn my love. I just simply love you. You know, you can rest here. Um, And that's beautiful. But what I was needing was an energy of movement and momentum and commitment that wasn't so jacked up. And when I reached for that inner voice, I got what I now call soccer dad, which sounded something like, okay, you're, you're doing great. You can do it. Just, you know, keep pushing. Everything's gonna be fine. You're doing great. You're doing great champ, you know, which only made me feel more anxious. And then I could find this, what I call my sort of inner drill sergeant, That was like, suck it up. Nobody wants to hear you whine. You know, like, stop complaining. Make it happen. It was this kind of angry, stern, aggressive inner voice. And I realized that what I was looking for was an encouraging inner father type. Like an encouraging parental type voice that could say, I love you. You're golden. You got this. And I've got you. Keep going. Something that had me be able to move forward with what I was creating without flaming out, freaking out, getting super overwhelmed or collapsing. And I didn't have that voice. Like I could recognize that I needed it, but it wasn't one that was really available to me. And it's been a quest for the last six, seven years or so since that moment to cultivate and develop that inner voice. But I think this is a huge part of living a 
working on creative projects, um, whether it's our art or, you know, writing, uh, I don't want to put limits on what that might mean to you, but working on creative projects, we will likely get negative feedback and including from ourselves. And if we're not able to hold ourselves and have creative cheerleaders, most likely we will be decimated by it. And so I find that finding those voices of encouragement that don't require us to be perfect, you know, those inner voices for me don't have me say that I have nothing to learn and I'm perfect and everything I do is the best and it's better than anyone else. Um, it's no, I, I, I don't, that doesn't actually really feel encouraging and it doesn't really serve me. I don't need to feel like I'm the best. I know I'm not the best. I'm just me. And that's not inherently the best or the worst, or it's just me. I'm doing it my way. And um, so finding like, what is the voice of encouragement that we're really needing and working over time to cultivate that voice. And, you know, for me, part of that process of cultivation is recognizing what voice I bring to myself in those moments instead of that, that encouraging voice and learning to interrupt that voice that might be shaming or perfection driven or punishing um, and instead bring in a voice that is that can say no to that voice that can have boundaries against my own um, self-loathing or self uh, like toxic self-criticism um, but also that allows for the feelings of failure that allows for the feelings of I can do better you know again it's not for me about cultivating a voice that says you're perfect and anybody who doesn't see that has to go far, far away, <laughs> but instead saying you're worthy and keep going. So, and there's more to it than that, but that piece, I think that developing a voice that allows us to be more shame resilient is a huge part of bringing our creative work into the world. Another thing that I think is a really huge part is finding the pleasure in it. I mean, some people do this really beautifully, really innately. Um, I don't know what their secret is. You know, people who just naturally create for their own pleasure at all times and are really self, self-sourced. I imagine that um, they probably have a different attachment style <laughs> than I do. Um However, I really feel like that that journey of, you know, choosing the path of, of, you know, engaging in pleasurable ways with our creativity, like this might be hard. And I think there's this, this idea that if it's pleasurable, it's not challenging. And I just don't find that to be true. I think things can be incredibly challenging and complex at times, and still there can be pleasure, um, you know, see any intimate relationship. And so how, though, can we engage with the process with more pleasure? How can we create more of a space of beauty around our creativity and our creative projects? How can we feel really good in our bodies when we are sitting down to write? Or when we are um, about to press play on the video, can we explore having fun with it if we are used to taking things really seriously? And with pleasure and with fun, I also I, I think so much of it is about the way that we approach it mentally, but also the containers that we create. You know, are we creating a container to step into doing our creative work or bringing it into the world that feels playful, that feels pleasurable, that feels nourishing and sweet for us. And, um, you know, so for myself with the podcast, before I sit down to write, I want to get in my body, do a little movement, do a little dancing. I make sure I've eaten. Um, if I am 
in a really crappy mood, I, I get to decide, am I going to create from this place or are, do I want to create a little bit more movement and a bit of a state change before I go into this creative exploration? And I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. Um, but when we do, I think, see the kind of disappointment or failure that can come with with putting ourselves into the world creatively at times, um, when that happens, if we had fun doing it and had some pleasure creating it, I think it can sometimes soften that blow and have things still feel worth it. Um, again, I'm not saying that finding pleasure in creation or creating pleasurable or playful contexts or containers guarantees that it's going to be easy. <laughs> I actually do not believe that it guarantees anything. Um, but I do think that sometimes it can have it feel more worth it. And another thing is really on the on this theme of or this track of pleasure, I try to be really careful not to compare myself, especially to people whose creative flow or style is really different than mine. Um, some people are prolific beyond belief. They seem to churn things out, you know, consistently, constantly, high volume, high quality even. And it's really easy to look at folks like that and be like, you just must be more connected to a sense of purpose. You must be better at this than I am. And I think that they are unfair comparisons. You know, everybody has their own pace. I know for myself as a mother, that's been game changing in so many ways, but certainly with producing creative work, I only have so much time and I still have admin and I still have emails and I still have a household to run and relationships to tend and on top of being a mother and then on top of all my creative pursuits and I just can't expect from myself my body my life what felt very natural actually when I was 25 um, or even 35 for that matter I'm just in a different place in my life right now. And so I think it's really important that we notice who we're comparing ourselves to and whether their lives, not that we need to be comparing ourselves to anyone, but are the people that we're comparing ourselves to, are their lives, is their creative rhythm anything like ours? And I say this so that we can say, so that we can get curious with ourselves. Well, what is my life actually? What is my creative flow and my creative rhythm actually? Um, because it's important, I believe, that we give ourselves time to get good and recognize that our talent may lie in one aspect of the entire creative process rather than many or all. So, for example, somebody can be an incredible writer, but really struggle to find the muse and really struggle with consistency. And that doesn't make them a less good writer. It means that they have profound talent and that the whole process is not easeful for them. And it may take time for each of us to find what our rhythm what our flow is in each season of our lives and um, and also just what's unique to us in terms of how we work and how we create. And yeah, so I find that part of that is really exploring and examining who we're comparing ourselves to. And uh, often I find that it's someone who's been doing what they're doing, which may be similar to us, but for a lot longer. <laughs> so that is a bit. I'm sure there's much more that I could share, um, but a bit about how we can navigate this creative gap and keep creating. 
And I promised that if you stuck around, I would tell you the story of when I met Ira Glass, because it's real embarrassing. Um, so <laughs> I'll try to keep it quick, but I was on a flight. I believe it was Seattle to San Francisco. And you know how smells really travel on a plane? Well, I reached into my bag at the end of the flight. It was kind of organizing things. And it turned out that I had a bottle of amber essential oil. This is like maybe 10 years ago. I had a bottle of amber essential oil in my bag and the lid had come loose. And I now had a Ziploc bag that had a bunch of amber essential oil floating in it, basically. And anyone who knows amber knows it's intense. It's sweet and it's sticky and it's strong. And um, because I was fussing around in my bag, I got it all over my fingers. And it was, you know, I opened the Ziploc bag and now it's just, you know, like a little amber bomb went off in, you know, row eight or whatever. And so, and the person beside me started doing this kind of dramatic um, coughing, but it seemed, it seemed a little... um, acted. (laughs) So they were kind of moving their head away and sort of half covering their nose and going like, (laughs) and uh, I'm feeling pretty self-conscious about this, um, this sweet stench that I've unleashed on this uh, section of the plane. And the plane lands, I'm covered in amber is what it is. And I stand up, we all stand up to gather our things. And I turn around and sitting right behind me is Ira Glass. And uh, I, I'm i just like, oh, is that him? And so we get off the plane and I see someone holding an iPad and it says glass on it. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's totally him. So I went up to him at the baggage carousel and I said, hi, are you Ira Glass? I don't even remember what I said exactly. Definitely blocked it out because I was so embarrassed. And I'm still reeking of Amber and he had been sitting behind me. So I was that woman. And uh, he said, yes. And I said something, you know, like, oh, I really love your work. And this American life is one of my favorite, you know, staple of I've listened to every episode, something like that. And I and I sort of blurted it out in this quick way, like, don't mean to take your time, just wrapping it up. And he put his ha- bags down to have a conversation with me. And um, I was so nervous. I, I don't even remember how I fumbled through that conversation. And then at the end, he reached his hand out to shake my hand. And um, I just remember thinking, this poor person, I have just doused in amber oil. Anyways, I don't know, even know if that's such a great story. But, you know, when you get to meet your celebrity crush and it's really embarrassing, it's, it's, it's probably a pretty decent story. So thank you <laughs> for listening to today's episode and to my silly story of when I fangirled and then got to meet Ira Glass. Thank you for being here. Before we head out today, I want to mention a workshop that I have coming up called Embody Your Leadership. And it's all about expanding your freedom to show up with vision and devotion. And really, this is what we've been talking about today, right? Like, how do we have these creative callings, whatever they may be, for bringing our unique gifts into the world in our own unique ways? And that's really what this workshop is all about. And so I invite you to join us at embodyyourleadership.com. We actually just moved the dates for these workshops. So have a peek um, because I needed more space in my creative flow. So embodyyourleadership.com, all about expanding your freedom to show up with vision and devotion. Thank you so much for being here, beloved. I want to extend my heartfelt invitation for you to join our podcast inner circle for free at devotionpodcast.com. You'll receive access to show notes and free bonuses, including my favorite guided meditation when you sign up. 
If you loved this episode, please share it, subscribe, and I'd be so grateful if you would leave a review. Our mixing and sound design is by Lou Jeannot, brand design by Neverland Studio, episode images by Liv Haddon, and our theme song is From the Ground Up by Ayla Nario. Thank you all, and thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful, and I'll talk to you soon. Raining from the crowd up, we will raise it from the ground up.